Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Darton. Robert Darton is currently the Carl H. Forsheimer University Professor and the Director of the University Library here at Harvard. Educated at Harvard and with a PhD from Oxford University, Professor Darton began his career with a brief stint in journalism before returning to academia and to Harvard as a, fellow, as a junior fellow at the Society of Fellows. Uh, he was then on the Princeton faculty for almost 40 years um, as a European history professor, and he took up his current post at Harvard in 2007. A major facet of Professor Darton's scholarly interest has been, his uh, has been in communication and the history of the written word. His new book, Poetry and the Police, Communication Networks in 18th Century Paris, examines this topic in the context of the mid-18th century's Affair of the Fourteen, in which 14 Parisians were arrested for disseminating songs and poetry against the monarchy. Their story helps shed light on the way information and opinion could be spread through written text, oral tradition, and song in a semi-literate society. Um, after the talk, we will have time for lots of questions, followed by a signing. Um, and as always, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank anyone who purchases a copy of the book here this evening. By doing so, you're supporting both a local independent bookstore and this author series. Um, and now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Robert Darton. Thank you, Rachel. I'm delighted to be here. Independent bookstores are a good cause, and uh, I'm glad to see that the cause is thriving. It's fun also that the bookstore can function as a kind of nerve center for intellectual exchange and just for fun. The, this book actually has two purposes, and one is fun. Uh, it's written not just for other history professors, but for the famous general educated reader, uh, you, the readers, will have to decide whether it actually is a good read, but it's meant to be. Uh, and in fact, it tells a detective story. Uh, the archives of the police in Paris are full of detective stories. This is the best one in many, many years of research I've ever come upon. It was so good, I thought that I'd, well, write a book about it and try to communicate some of the flavor of detective work 250 years ago. So that's part of it, to follow the detectives as they follow suspects through the streets of Paris and finally fill the Bastille with 14 of them, hence the name of the Affair of the 14. The second purpose is more serious, but it's not super serious. The idea is to develop a history of communication, to understand how information actually traveled two centuries and more ago. Uh, now, we know in general that it traveled through the printed word. But France at this time, roughly 1750, didn't have real newspapers, that is, papers with what we would call news in them. Uh, they didn't even have a daily newspaper until 1774, much after England and Germany. Uh, and in fact, there was heavy censorship of such papers that did appear so that if you wanted to find out what was really going on in the corridors of power, uh, you couldn't go to the press. Where did you go? Well, to a variety of places. One, for example, was the Tree of Krakow, which was an actual tree in the gardens of the Palais Royal where people would gather to gossip about events, news, the kind of things that you could not find in the press. Uh, but they were, my point is, they were gossiping. So information traveled through oral communication systems. But orality, the spoken word, is the most difficult thing for historians to trace because by definition it disappears into the air. So it's very, very hard to know how oral messages actually traveled in a society that existed 100, 200, 300 years ago, a society that was semi-literate. We have various estimates about the literacy rate in France and in Paris around this time. It's guesswork, but it's fair to say that, well, of the population in general, perhaps half of the adult males could read, at least in a fairly primitive way. Women had a much lower literacy rate. Literacy was much worse or lower in the South than in the North. 
but we're talking about a world in which it's normal not to be able to read or not to be able to read very much. So even if there were newspapers, most people couldn't read them. How did they find out about what was going on? Well, that's the, uh, the real subject of this book, how oral communication networks actually function. And it's fun, I think, because uh, it all began with an order that came down from the most powerful man in France, aside from the king. He was the Comte d'Argenson, Minister of War. Uh, in the spring of 1749, the order came from Versailles to the Lieutenant General of Police, the head of the police force, and it said, find the author of the poem that begins with these words, Monstre dans la noire furie. Uh, monster who's black fury. That's all they knew. And it was up to the cops to discover the author. Well, they had, we don't know exactly how many, some estimates say as many as 3,000 spies known as mouches or mouchards, that is flies that buzzed around the cafes of Paris, picking up gossip, listening into conversations, and reporting what people were talking about in these oral communication networks to the police. So the police were tuned to what people were saying. And that, when you think of it, isn't surprising because oral communication was so important. So the order went out. The spies spread through the cafes, the marketplaces, the public gardens of Paris. And after a certain amount of time, uh, a note arrived. I found it in the archives. One small piece of paper, a scribbled note. Uh, in fact, I reproduce it uh, in the book. It made up of two sentences, and it says, Monseigneur, uh, I have found someone who had the abominable verse against the king, against the king. So the monster whose black fury was indeed Louis XV. And I can procure him for you, if you like. The reward was 12 Louis d'or, which was almost a year's wages for an unskilled laborer. And then the police set to work. Well, it's a lot of fun to see how they set to work. They had the name of the person. They had his address. And they followed him as he left a cafe. They stationed a carriage around a corner. And Inspector Joseph Demery, who specialized in this kind of thing, a very interesting man, who had great taste, by the way, in literature, uh, uh, accosted uh, this person whose name was Francois Bonis, who he was a medical student. And there, the idea was to capture him without making a lot of noise, because they assumed that he was part of the network. And so they had to induce him to disappear quietly into the Bastille. Uh, what the inspector Demery did was to say, Monsieur, um, the Maréchal de Noailles would like to speak with you about an affair of honor. A woman, a captain of the cavalry, uh, you understand. Wouldn't you please step into this carriage? Well, the Maréchal de Noailles dealt with a uh, duels and people who wanted to kill one another over women and that kind of thing. But the student knew that he wasn't involved with any woman, didn't know any soldiers. So he followed Demery into the carriage and paf, he disappeared in the Bastille. There he was interrogated. Now the interrogations of Bastille prisoners are fascinating to read because they're written in the form of dialogue question, answer, question, answer. It's all taken down by a scribe. The prisoner signs each page or initials it to testify to the accuracy of it all. And therefore, you can learn a lot about, well, the circumstances of the transmission of messages, of information. Uh, in this case, the police said to this l medical student, um, where did you get this poem? And if you don't tell us, we are going to treat you as its author. And authors like you uh, tend to wind up in the iron cage that's suspended in Mont Saint-Michel 
uh, it's enough, they say, to drive a man mad. So I suggest that you tell us the source of this poem. Bonis immediately squealed. He said he got it from a priest whom he happened to meet in a hospital. The priest is arrested the next day, same treatment. Uh, he says where he got the source, the next person is arrested, uh, and so on, until the police fill the Bastille with 14 persons. They never found the author of the poem that began, Monstre dans la noire furie, in a way, because it didn't have a single author, it was, like many poems of the time, a case of collective creation. You got lots of people adding verse to it, and it's a sort of palimpsest of uh, poetry uh, that develops over time as people add uh, new uh, stanzas. Well, okay, I, I came upon this wonderful dossier in the archives of the Bastille, and I wasn't, of course, looking for it. The best discoveries you make in the archives are of things that you're not trying to find. Uh, and so if you see something interesting, you just follow that trail. In this case, because the police had themselves had made the trail, it was possible to see exactly how a poem traveled through Parisian society at this time. Now, the interesting thing, A gets it from B, B gets it from C, C gets it from D, but D gets it from E, and at the same time he says, and by the way, I got these three other poems from X, X is arrested, he got more from Y, and so on, and soon you can actually follow this with tremendous detail, and in fact, I drew a diagram of six poems as they make their way through Parisian society. Uh, it's quite fascinating, and I think uh, unprecedented, as an opportunity to watch messages traveling through a particular social system. Still, you've got to ask yourself, what was all the fuss about? Well, it turns out that uh, people were not only composing poems all the time, uh, they were reciting them in cafes, they would scribble a new verse uh, on a piece of paper and keep it in their pockets or up their sleeves so that when they arrived in a cafe, you could pull out a poem and or a new verse to an, old, uh, an older poem and re recite it to impress the gang at your favorite cafe, like the Procup, where people had certain tables. Or frequently, they were recited in groups in the public gardens. Uh, a lot of these people arrested were students, people like you, and they uh, recited poems to one another in, in their dining halls at the University of Paris. Uh, there was one case I found to my amazement of a professor, a man called Pierre Sigorne, who actually dictated the poems to his students in a lecture hall. It was what the French call a dicté, uh, and one of the poems he dictated by memory, had 84 lines in Alexandrins. The art of memory at this time is still going strong. And I found that several of these students had memorized it like that. So I don't know how many of you could do this. It's quite a feat, it seems to me. The poems, then, are being copied. Uh, they're being read aloud. They're passed around on bits of paper. And finally, they're sung because many of them are written to be sung to the tune of. You see this on the pieces of paper. You, you might get a title, and then it will say, sung to the tune of, and you hear uh, the name of the tune. Not the musical annotation, but the name. Sur l'air de, and then it could be les pendus, or la béquille du père Baraba. Well, I'll come back to this in a minute. But it's clear that one form of the oral transmission was actually song. Now this to me was completely new. I never, I'm not very musical myself and I never thought that I would be doing research in musicology, but that's the direction things took. I'll get back to that in a minute. But you might be asking why the police were so intense on this particular detective work. In on the 24th of April, 1749, the government fell. Louis XV dismissed 
his most powerful minister, a man called the Comte de Maurepas, uh, and sent him into exile. It was the biggest political event of the year. And if you read all of the contemporary memoirs, the journals, all possible references in search of an explanation of why the king did this, because this was a man who had been part of the ministry, believe it or not, for 36 years. He was a real pillar of the government, probably the most powerful man uh, in France until he got canned. Why? Well, all of the memoirs and the letters and so on agree as to the cause. Chanson. Songs. Now, that oversimplifies things a little bit. However, it's basically true And one particular song. The song referred to an incident that had occurred soon before this explo political explosion. Uh, and it referred, the, the incident was actually a, a very small dinner party in what were known as the petits appartements, the little apartments of Versailles. That's the private quarters of the king where he could relax, speak in a normal way, behave like an ordinary person, and enjoy himself. Uh, Madame de Pompadour, his new mistress, had invited the king her cousin, Madame d'Estrade, and this minister, Maurepas, to a dinner. So there are just four of them. And when she arrived, she had a bouquet of white hyacinths in her hand, and she gave a flower to each of the other three persons. A nice gallant gesture, if you like. The next day, the poem appeared, and it went as follows. Par, I'll give it to you first in French. Par vos façons nobles et franches, Iris, vous enchantez nos cœurs. Sur nos pas, vous semez des fleurs, mais ce sont des fleurs blanches. Uh, by your noble and frank manner, Iris, you enchant our hearts. On our paths, you strew flowers, but they are white flowers. That was a poem that brought down the ministry. Now, one of my principles in doing research, it's derived somewhat from anthropologists, is as soon as you encounter something that you can't figure out, something opaque, you may be on to something. And that's where you should concentrate your uh, research energy. So what was it about this poem that was so spectacularly awful that it brought down the Morapa ministry? Well, it turns out that to the finely tuned ears of Versailles, it was indeed outrageous because white flowers, fleur blanche or fleur blanche, referred to venereal disease in menstrual discharge and so the poem really said that Madame de Pompadour was giving Louis XV VD. That was too much, even by the standards of Versailles, where things were very nasty indeed. I don't know if you've seen the film Ridicule, which was quite a hit some years ago, but to really stick it to somebody was part of the game played by courtiers, but this was going beyond the rules of the game. So Morapa was dismissed. Meanwhile, though, this poem was accompanied by a whole flood of other poems, and Mirabeau's, uh, Maurepas' rival was this other minister, the Comte d'Argenson, who wanted to score points with Madame de Pompadour and the king by uh, initiating a witch hunt of poems and poetry and poets. In fact, what he hoped is that he could trace these poems to some one who was hatching a plot against him and the king within the court. So the idea is to use this manhunt uh, for poems in order to uh, win in the constant power struggle, which is court politics. Well, that kind of politics is usually dismissed by most historians today as what they call la petite histoire, little history, or uh, histoire événementielle, event history. It's supposed to be very bad. 
And I found myself getting involved deeper and deeper into this kind of event history, which uh, back in a few de decades ago was the kind most scorned by avant-garde historians. Uh, and I wanted, of course, to be avant-garde. I think it actually is an avant-garde book uh, because I didn't really care why the government fell. What I cared about was the way information flowed in this preliterate society. So I began actually asking myself, what is it about songs that make them so powerful as a means of disseminating information? Uh, uh, in, I began doing research trying to find little scraps of songs that were actually exchanged at this time. Some of them, uh, the police confiscated when they frisked someone who was, they, they arrest him, they put him in the busty, they frisk him, and out comes a poem. I found several examples of these bits of paper with a new verse written on them. But most of the uh, examples of the actual poems I, and songs I could turn up were in special scrapbooks known as chansonniers, sort of song scrapbooks, because songs were so popular in the streets of Paris that people were always copying them down and then pasting them in a scrapbook or uh, having a secretary, if they were wealthy, copy out the latest song or the latest verse to another song. And I discovered, uh, I went through, I think, about a dozen of these so-called scrapbooks, chansonniers, they're enormous. Uh, one, the, one of the most famous, uh, has uh, 48 volumes. And one volume can have 600 pages, just crammed with songs. So I did some statistics. And it turns out that the French pr were producing, by my calculation, in the mid-18th century, at least one new song every three days. And that's just the songs that survived. So they were probably producing several songs every day. And that's because it was so easy to do. Anyone, you, they're simple ballads, most of them. Anyone can uh, work out their eight-foot ballads, and uh, you, you just rhyme some things, but to the music. And then uh, the song spread with incredible power. Why? Because music is a great mnemonic device. Now, I don't know. If you have feel this, but when you think of it, isn't it true that you carry around in your head a repertory of tunes? We all have them. Uh, they might vary a little bit from person to person or from generation to generation. Now, I come from a generation where we picked up a lot of our tunes, I'm sorry to say, from commercials. I will now give you an example. Brace yourself, I'm going to sing. I don't know if any of you would know this, but some maybe. <clears throat> Pepsi-Cola hits the spot, 12 full ounces, that's a lot. Twice as much and better, too. Pepsi-Cola is a drink for you. You've, you heard, you've heard it, right? OK. I can't get it out of my head. You know, when I was a little kid, uh, you heard it all the time. Now, one day in my grade school, I think I was in the second grade or maybe the third grade, a wise guy appeared, one of these, you know, sort of marginal types that any class has, and he sang the following song. Christianity hits the spot, 12 apostles, that's a lot. Holy Ghost and a virgin too, Christianity's a thing for you. I was deeply shocked. I'd never heard or encountered irreligion before. And when you think of it, you know, pretty soon you can't get that version of the song out of your head. You are mocking the sacred mysteries of the Christian church. And not only that, I think there's a more subtle message, which is Christianity is being sold to you like a pile of goods the way Pepsi-Cola is being sold to you. So it is, in fact, a way to, in a kind of insidious manner, to undercut your faith. Well, I don't know how effective it was, but it, I assure you, I, I still have it crammed into my head. This is what was going on in 18th century France, because everyone knew these tunes. And uh, in following the evolution of the songs through these scrapbooks, 
I dis discovered that you would take a, a very popular song and it would be identified by the tune uh, and people would add verses after new events occurred so that if you found enough copies of the song, you could date them. There was one in particular called Cune Batarde de Catin, uh, that a bastard strumpet is the first line. They're known often by their first line. That's a reference to Madame de Pompadour. Um, th this, I, I found nine different versions of this song scattered through the scrapbooks. They vary from 11 to 23 verses, and each verse uh, pillories a minister or a general or a bishop, everyone gets it. Uh, and as the song evolves over time, so I was able to trace it over nearly two years, you can watch new events occur and new people being made fun of. So it's, in other words, the songs are running commentaries on current events, and they are a means of communication that spread like wildfire through uh, Paris. You should imagine walking in the streets of Paris and you wouldn't have to go far before you'd hear someone singing. Now there were professional songsters, uh, uh, chanteurs or chansonniers, who were in effect beggars, who would station themselves at the Pont Neuf or in the Palais Royal or some other uh, important part of the city and sing away, usually with a fiddle while singing, or with a hurdy-gurdy, known as a vielle in French, uh, and they would just hope to collect money from people, the way you see that going on today in Harvard <laughs> Square. Um, those were the professionals, but then they had other people, workers, who improvised new verse to old tunes while they were at work. The most famous uh, was um, uh, a man called, Ooh, I'm forgetting, I'm blocking on his name, Sal Favard. Uh, Favard was a, uh, as a little boy, his, his father was a baker, and he used to knead the dough in his father's bakery while improvising songs just for the fun of it uh, at the same time. And once a, a man called the Maréchal de Richelieu was passing by and heard this kid singing and thought, wow, this is talent. He recruited him for the Opéra Comique, and uh, Favard became the greatest songwriter, if you like, of 18th century France. Uh, there still is a room dedicated to him in the uh, Opéra Comique of Paris. So people are singing all the time. I think this is a, an important subject, one that really deserves a lot of study. But the question then arose, what did it sound like? Uh, the manuscripts only said, sung to the tune of, but I never heard of tunes like La Béquille du Père Baraba, that's the crutch of Father Baraba. Uh, and no one today alive in France would have heard of such tunes. So if you wanted to do a full history of this, you needed to know, I think, what the music was. Why? Well, because you could imagine that if you heard a, a certain words to a particular tune once, you might associate that message with the next version of words to the same tune and so on, so that the music would be a kind of palimpsest of sound uh, that would build up associations. So I then try to figure out what the music was. And for fortunately, in another part of the National Library in France, the music department, they had keys to the songs. So you just look up a title or the first line, and then you get the musical annotation. Now, um, I have a friend who, uh, I, for a while, she was actually an opera singer, but she's become a cabaret performer in Paris. She's very well known, and she's tremendously talent, talented. Her name is Hélène de la Vaux. She agreed to sing these songs that are surrounding the affair of the 14 to the actual music. So it's possible for us today to recapture the way the songs actually sounded 250 years ago. Now, I'm not claiming that it's a perfect reproduction of this past experience. 
because Hélène has a wonderful mezzo-soprano voice, and these people in the streets of Paris just belted the stuff out. However, I think it's getting as close as we can get to the actual sounds of the past, and that one of the jobs of a historian is to try to recapture sound the way the past actually sounded. So I hope that this, will, this book will be a, at least the beginning of an attempt to add a new dimension to historical study. Uh, at the end, it has uh, a program that of, uh, accompanies the songs that Hélène de Lavo sings. So the reader can actually um, listen to the songs. They're available on open access online, free. Uh, you can just type it in, listen to your computer, and then follow it in French and in English translation as you hear her sing. So we're going to give it a try now. And first, I will uh, play f or have Aaron play for you, the disc jockey, right? Yeah. Uh, play for you the song that brought down the government. The, she, Hélène sings three versions of it. First, it's a sweet, very innocent kind of... Um, gallant love song. It's only four lines, so it won't take long, but you'll get the tune. Wake up, beautiful sleeper. If my discourse interests you, or if you are scrupulous, keep sleeping or pretend to be sleeping. So the lover comes to the window. Ah. That's not Hélène de Laveau. <laughs> so, in other words, a very lovely, simple little ballad. Then the ballad, which everyone knows, this is one of the most uh, best-known uh, tunes, because I also did statistics to figure out which tunes were most common, is used for satire. In this case, the song says the same thing. Wake up, beautiful, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll try to translate it as we go. Can you, can you hear me all right? This is making fun of a duchess. On your, on your, following your footsteps, beautiful duchess. Chauve souris. On your steps, beautiful duchess, you are followed by a swarm of bats. So you see the traditional version being used for a satire, in this case, against a duchess. But now it's the one with the white flowers, and this is how it sounds. Oh, yeah, on your, s number three. Yeah. So, par vos façons nobles et franches, by your frank and noble manners, sans noble, Iris, you enchant our hearts. On our uh, pathway, you, you strew flowers, but they are white flowers. That's the song that brought down the government. Now, we could go on and on, uh, and I thought you might be interested in the song that I mentioned that pillories one minister after another. It begins with the king and Madame de Pompadour, uh, and it's a very, again, a very widely known, very simple tune. Um, it, uh, it, it has a refrain. Ah, le voilà, ah, le voici, celui qui n'en a nul souci. Oh, here he is, there he is, he who hasn't got a care. I imagine it as a children's game. I don't know, you must have played this game in which you dance around someone who is in the middle and he's the cheese, the cheese stands alone. Uh, well, they're, in this case, I think they're making fun of the king who doesn't have a care. In other words, the kingdom's going to hell and he's just, uh, well, having royal mistresses, spending money and not helping out anybody. That's the message of the refrain, which is attached to satire against each of his ministers and now beginning with Madame de Pompadour. So let's, that, this should be number four. So it begins, qu'une bâtarde de catin, that a bastard slut. It advances herself in court. 
if in love and in wine, Louis thinks he can be glorious. Le voilà, le voici. He who has no care. Now the next person, this is about the Dauphin, the heir to the throne, who can be as stupid as he looks, that this is the fate of France that you can read in his face. A le voilà, a le voici, celui qui n'en a nul souci. So it's so simple, that's my point. Let's stop there and try another one. That, that music isn't so good, but some of the music is actually, I think, quite lovely. This makes fun of the, here's, before you play it, uh, Aaron, this is a song about the peace treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle. It's an event, you know, the peace treaty is announced. And peace treaties were published, as it was said, in Paris. That is, you would have a parade of people on horses, uh, preceded by men on foot with trumpets. And they would blow the trumpets, beat the drums, stop at seven different parts of Paris and then someone would read out the text of the treaty because it's an illiterate society and you, you know the idea was it should be published in the sense of being made public. Well um, the mayor of Paris actually the uh, uh, he didn't exactly have the title of mayor the Prévost des Marchands organized in addition to this a festival uh, in which wine is given out and people celebrate the peace by uh, attending a kind of parade. Well, the parade backfired, all kinds of things went wrong, and this song mocks not only the uh, bungling of the celebrations, but the treaty itself, which was a diplomatic disaster for France. So it's interesting to see how a song picks up uh, a current event, like a peace treaty. And in this case, I think you'll enjoy the music a little more. I won't try to translate it, but that's the theme. So, so we could go on and on, uh, but you get the idea. I mean, the music, in some cases, that's, I think, a lovely tune, a little thing, tune. Some of the tunes are kind of boring, uh, but in each case, you've got someone getting satirized in this way that informed this semi-literate public about events, about the big personalities, the people most in view, and I think that ultimately created something that, for lack of a better word, I would call public opinion. Now, that's a tricky subject, and I don't feel I've proven absolutely what public opinion was, but I hope that in this book that I've opened up a way for us to get closer to what I think was an early information society. You know, we say we live in an information society, well, sure we do, but my view is that every society was a society with information, and the information traveled in different ways. So one uh, part of the historian's mission should be to discover those ways, to trace the messages through society, and to try to figure out how they might have mobilized public opinion. Of course, most of the songs are satirical and rather hostile to the government, but some are not. 
Um, and indeed, there's nothing revolutionary about these songs. I mean, I think this is a kind of traditional satirical way of talking about les grands, important people. Um, but these important people sometimes planted songs. And, th and I did find examples of that. Now, I don't think I have any recorded here, but you could find practically every point of view being expressed. And some of them aren't political at all. I mean, they're songs about the weather, they're songs about um, recent totally apolitical events too. So it's not as if they represent only one point of view. The 14. Um, well, of course, part of this is, a, if you like, a sociological study of who they were and what kind of milieu they came from. Their, actually, their ages vary from 16 to 31, but most were in their early 20s. They're students, they're abbe or young priests, they are law clerks, they work in notaries' offices. So they come from a kind of middling professional class background. Uh, they're r rather similar, and indeed, the head of the uh, of the Ministry of War, the Comte d'Argenson, corresponds with the head of the police, and he says, "This smells of the Latin Quarter." After reading one of the poems, he's very scornful of these pedant-type students, um, and, and so that's one sociological location of, but. The other songs, including the one that I uh, played for you, that be, uh, that is "A le voilà, à le voici" about the king, that was very popular, and there's evidence of it being sung in sort of working class neighborhoods, uh, etc. So, um, although the fourteen are kind of homogeneous as a group, the song is going everywhere. What then happened to the fourteen? Well, they were kept incommunicado because, of course, the idea was to find out from whom they got the poem. And after 14 arrests, the police just gave up because they wanted to find out that maybe some courtier was at the origin of it all. And they, they just couldn't prove this, so they quit. The 14 stayed in the Bastille usually for about three or four months, which is typical. The Bastille was not a prison in the modern sense of the word. But after uh, doing time for three or four months, they, uh, the prisoners were all exiled. And fortunately, so they can't exile outside of Paris for a certain distance. So they're sent off to the provinces. And in France today, you use the verb to be limogé, to be sent to Limoges. No one wants to live in Limoges, which is far from all of the boulevards or the cafes of Paris. They were, in effect, limogé. And some of them wrote letters back to the police begging to be allowed back into Paris. The man I began with, Francois Bonis, the medical student, uh, writes letter after a letter. Uh, he's sent from one place, and then he's allowed to go to another place in the provinces. And he basically is trying to find a wife. What you do is you want a girl with a good dowry. And he talks about his hunt for a dowry in his correspondence with the, with the head of the police, saying, please have pity on me. I'm a good guy. I didn't mean to do anything bad about Madame de Pompadour. And I need a dowry. Otherwise, my life is over. Um, well, eventually, he, did, he was allowed back in Paris. And eventually, he did marry. But he viewed this as, uh, as a major disaster, which indeed it was for his career. Similar stories could be told about the others. None of them were suffered horribly for it. None of them were tortured. All of that is the part of the mythology of the Bastille. And the interrogations showed that the police were actually very careful in the way they gathered evidence. It's, I mean, this in general is a wonderful kind of subject. And of course, there have been studies of ballads. The 45 even figure among these people, because that's 1745, uh, the, the uprising in Scotland, with Bonnie Prince Charlie, well, after that, as I'm sure you know, Bonnie Prince Charlie goes back to Paris, and he's a hero to the Parisians, and many of these songs are about Bonnie Prince Charlie because the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, which ended the War of the Austrian Succession in 1748, had a proviso that he had to be expelled from France. The French were harboring him, and the British insisted that he be kicked out of France. Well, the way they kicked him out was actually to arrest him as he was going into the opera uh, to 
handcuff him, and they threw him into a coach, and they had soldiers stationed all the way to the dungeon of Vincennes, where they put him, and then finally got him out of the country. This deeply shocked the Parisians, because it looked like raw despotism, you know, real violence used against a hero. And a lot of the songs say what the man we call Bonnie Prince Charlie, they call him Prince Edward, Prince Edouard. Uh, there, there's one that says, he's a hero in change, and you, Louis, are nobody on the throne. So it's funny, it's, it, I find it fascinating to see the cult of Bonnie Prince Charlie, who's not much admired by historians, um, as, as the supreme hero and the counter example to what a king should be. But there are many other examples. One is, uh, you know, at the time of the love affair between uh, Edward VIII and um, Mrs. Wallace Simpson, uh, the English press was not allowed to discuss this at all. I mean, you, it, it's, it's not today. Prince Di and, and, and uh, the, the Prince of Wales were all over the papers. But then, 1936, it was absolutely taboo. But it was spread through songs. And one of the songs was, Hark the Herald Angel Sing, Mrs. Simpson's Pinched Our King. Uh, <laughs> And it's another example. You take a, a Christmas carol and then you put a political message onto it. I found several Christmas carols being used by these people of today. I hope you voted uh, and so on, but uh, I shouldn't reveal my vote. Uh, it's funny, I, I'm often asked about this, and I did a previous book that was uh, published uh, about six months ago in Paris, and there was a lot of fuss about it because it was about slander. And the French press kept asking me that question. Well, what about Sarkozy and his wife and all this stuff? Because there's a lot of talk about that in, in, in France today, and you know, we, do, we go in for the same thing. There was a book called Primary Colors. I don't know if you heard about it, and that's uh, as, about the sex life of Bill Clinton but under a false name. It's a so-called roman à clé, you know, in which you had to guess the names, the real names of the characters who figure in it. So um, what do I do when asked with such a question? I duck it. Uh, I, I like to say, especially in France, it's up to you, the reader, to see if there are any parallels with the current situation. Uh, but I recently was drawn into blogging uh, by the New York Review of Books, which has its own blog. And they asked me to compare blogs today with this kind of uh, sensationalist songs and gossip uh, in the 18th century. Uh, and I was able to uh, come up with strikingly similar instances of usually sexual adventures of public figures. There's a lot of it. It's around all the time. And you could say it's trivial. Who cares? This is, according to some political sciences, noise that exists in any political system. Why take it seriously? My answer is, well, sometimes it is maybe just noise. But in, the, in April of 1749, it was taken very seriously by the government. And indeed, it brought down the ministry of Morapa, so that songs were powerful for the reasons I tried to explain. So I think people like you maybe could do a study of songs today, or blogs, or tweets, or whatever is actually communicating messages of this sort. Why didn't I actually print the musical annotation? Actually, some of it is printed. Um, not much, I agree, but let's see if I can sh find an example. Yeah, here's one. And I, I've, got a, I, I've got a couple of others. Um, maybe I should have done more of that, but I thought, you know, let the reader get some sense of what they're like. Th these are often manuscript um, pamphlets. They cost a mere six pennies, six sous. Uh, and there were specialists who... Uh, who sold this kind of literature with the music. So it was a whole branch of commerce at the time. Uh, I'm not sure that the Harvard Bookstore has, sells anything like this, but who, anything's possible. But, you know, I just gave some examples of it, and mainly I was interested in the sound. Well, uh, 
I've spent a fair amount of time trying to identify the authors of the songs. In general, uh, I do think they were created collectively. That is to say, verse one is done by somebody, I don't know whom, and verse two by somebody else, and people keep adding verses, etc. So they are produced like that, you know, as a kind of uh, series of improvisations. Some, however, are produced by individuals. Uh, I have not been able to identify many of the individuals. I think they were varied. Um, yeah, I'm afraid my research isn't very satisfying in that respect. Although, well, I'll give you one example. There was a woman, uh, this is in another police file, called Madame Dubois, very common French name. <clears throat> now, Madame Dubois came from what you could call the working class, but she was literate. And her main problem in life was Monsieur Dubois, her husband, who was a lout. I mean, he was just impossible. So she decided that she would get rid of him by writing a seditious poem, not a song, uh, attacking the king and Madame de Pompadour. She then um, uh, wrote a letter denouncing him anonymously to the lieutenant general of police saying, um, I found this poem, which I included in my letter, on the ground after I saw two men talking to each other and laughing loudly. So I followed them, I picked it up and I followed them and it's and she gives the address of her husband. So the idea was that he would disappear in the Bastille and never come out. And after he was indeed arrested, she thought, oh, uh, he is allowed, but you know, should he spend the rest of his life in a dungeon? And she went to the head of the police and confessed everything, uh, and this appears in the archives. So that's an example where someone, he was a clerk in a store, uh, someone who is you know, quite far down in the social hierarchy actually is involved in this sort of activity. Well, there are two cases in which we know who created them. The most famous is actually was produced by Morapa himself. He was the man who was cashiered over songs because he was famous for collecting songs. And he used to amuse people in Versailles by reciting songs against himself and laughing about them. Uh, and that's why that's one of the reasons that we, it was believed that he, he'd written the song about the white flowers, which he probably did not write. We don't know who wrote it. Uh, in any case, Morapa, who was a count, a very important and wealthy man, collected all of these songs, and then he had a secretary who wrote them out in this 58-volume collection called the Chansonnier Morapa. There was, there's another, which is, I think, 46 volumes, and that's the Chansonnier Clérambeau. Again, a collection produced by a great aristocrat with a secretary, so the handwriting is beautiful. However, other collections just have the bits of paper pasted in, uh, sometimes copied out, but they, they're a mess. I mean, it's the messiest scrapbook you ever saw, but this thick, you know, with just one chunk of paper after another, and I think, I, maybe I give some photographs of them. Um, you, I mean, you just have to look at uh, look at a photograph, and you get get the idea. There, the, the best ones are not in the the great Bibliothèque Nationale de France, but in the Bibliothèque Historique de la Ville de Paris, and they've never been studied. But I mean, I'm talking about literally thousands of songs. It's it's just a wonderful subject, I think. That's, there was a consistent effort to uh, save them. I don't really have an answer to that question, except people were fascinated by songs. And you wanted to have a copy of the latest song. I mean, I've uh, run into examples where X is arrested and he has been trading songs with someone else who has another verse in a cafe. So they were considered amusing, interesting, fascinating even. Uh, they were collected by people, and they were collected the way, I don't know, you might collect uh, baseball cards or something like that, but they, I think, basically, because they tickled the collective funny bone of the Parisians, uh, and they were shocking often. People loved to be shocked. They provided um, 
illegal commentary on public affairs, which you couldn't get elsewhere. You've put that all together, and they are irresistible to people in the 18th century. So I'm not surprised that there were collections, and there were collections of different kinds. Uh, sometimes they have jokes interspersed with them in prose, um, or a bon mot that someone says. Uh, the, the, the Parisians are jotting things down all the time. And my uh, technique, in a way, is to try to wade through all of this material in order to find channels of communication and to understand the way the information industry of the time actually functioned. So you can ask, a, as it were, a modern question about this very archaic practice and I think come up with something fairly convincing about an aspect of history. So, thank you. Yeah.